Hello and welcome to a new episode of Interpreting India. From geopolitical complexities to economic uncertainties, India faces critical challenges in its quest for a more prominent role on the world stage. This season, we at Carnegie India continue to bring voices from India and around the world to examine the role of technology, the economy, and international security in shaping India's future. I'm Srinath Raghavan, and in this episode, we reflect on the history of India's relationship with China. The American writer William Faulkner famously said, the past is never dead, it is not even past. This is absolutely true of India's relations with China. History, in this instance, weighs heavily and continuously on the current state of India-China relations. Now, most accounts of this relationship that we have tend to focus on the disputed boundary between the two sides, the related question of Tibet, and the resultant crises and conflicts over the last several decades. Today, we will discuss a brilliant new book that focuses on a dimension of the relationship that has long been neglected. The book is titled Crosswinds, Nehru, Joe, and the Anglo-American Competition Over China. It is a thoroughly researched and highly readable and very perceptive account of how independent India had to craft a policy towards China in the first decade of its existence against the backdrop of a forgotten competition between a declining imperial power in Asia, Britain, and the new superpower in the region and the world, the United States. Focusing on issues and episodes that tend to be glossed over in much of the existing writing, this book presents not just a new account of the past, but as important and interesting pointers and questions for the present and future of India's policy towards Asia and China. Joining us today to discuss this book is its author, Vijay Gokhale. Vijay Gokhale is a non-resident senior fellow at Carnegie India. He retired from the Indian Foreign Service in January 2020 after a diplomatic career spanning 39 years. From January 2018 to 2020, when he retired, he served as the Foreign Secretary of India. Prior to his tenure as Foreign Secretary, Mr. Gokhale had served as India's High Commissioner to Malaysia, as Ambassador of India to Germany, and as Ambassador of India to the People's Republic of China from January 2016 to October 2017. He has served as head of India-Taipei Association in Taiwan from July 2003 to January 2007. Throughout his diplomatic career, Mr. Gokhale has worked extensively on matters relating to the Indo-Pacific region with a special emphasis on Chinese politics and diplomacy. Since his retirement from the Foreign Service, he has been prolific and perceptive as an author and commentator on India's foreign policy and global affairs more broadly. Mr. Gokhale is also a distinguished faculty at the Symbiosis International University in Pune. He has contributed opinion pieces to a range of publications, the New York Times, Foreign Policy, Times of India, Hindu, Indian Express, and so on. He's also the author of three books, which have been received extremely well. Tiananmen Square, The Making of a Protest, published by HarperCollins in 2021. The Long Game, How the Chinese Negotiate with India, published by Penguin Random House in 2021 also. And After Tiananmen, The Rise of China, which is published by HarperCollins in 2022. Crosswinds, Nehru, Joe and the Anglo-American Competition over China, published by Penguin Random House India this month, is his fourth book and in very quick succession. Vijay Gokhale, welcome to Interpreting India. Thank you, Srinath. I want to really begin by asking uh, how you turned to this particular period of India's foreign policy in Asia and particularly its relationship with China. Um, you know, your book focuses principally on the first 10 years or so since the PRC was established uh, and focuses on aspects which typically tend to be neglected by most existing histories of this region. So I'm just wondering, as a person who has such, had such a long and distinguished diplomatic career, you focus on it, 
India's dealings with China in more contemporary times in your more recent books, three of which uh, have, have already come out uh, to much acclaim. But I was just wondering what prompted you to go back to this somewhat distant past? So really two questions uh, intrigued me throughout my diplomatic career, Srinath. The first, of course, was the obvious one, which is why did we recognize the People's Republic of China so quickly after it was founded on the 1st of October 1949? We were, after all, only the second non-socialist country after Burma to convey our recognition of the new regime. But second, the second question that used to uh, intrigue me was how did we shape our relationship with the United States? And did our relationship with China have any impact upon it? And therefore, really, the book uh, was, in a sense, a quest to find answers to these two questions. And the narrative that I have crafted, therefore, involves evolving relations with both the People's Republic of China and the United States of America. And uh, that took me really to the situation that was uh, existing in the Pacific at the end of the Second World War. What we saw was a newly dominant United States, but we also still had a fading but still very powerful British Empire. And there were very different uh, objectives that both these powers had. The United States, of course, wanted to stabilize the region after it had defeated Japan and also to consolidate its own hegemony over the Pacific. But the United Kingdom was very much an imperial power. It wanted to preserve its colonies, its trading rights, its special privileges. And nowhere was that more important than China. So when the communist government was established, a gulf between the two principal Western allies became wider and wider. And the basic contention of the book is that this Anglo-American competition shaped India's policy towards not only China, but the United States as well. And in a sense, uh, uh, it is not so much the US-Soviet competition as the Anglo-American competition which had a very fundamental influence on us uh, in shaping our foreign policy in the early years. Now, from the beginning of the Second World War, especially when the Japanese attacks on uh, British, Dutch and French imperial holdings in Southeast Asia took place, it was evident as the war progressed that the United States was by far the most influential player in the context of Asia and the Asia-Pacific, uh, simply because of the way that the war was being prosecuted. Nevertheless, as you pointed out, um, Britain still had significant interests in the region, including, of course, in India, with whom also it wanted certain kinds of commercial and security treaties prior to Indian independence, but those could not be worked out. But nevertheless, as you quite rightly say, uh, Britain had a lot of commercial business interests in China dating back to the 19th century, which it wanted to hold on to. Uh, it is also interesting that at this point of time, even before India becomes independent on 15th of August 1947, there is an interim government in India, but there is also a British Indian sort of representative to the Republic of China in Nanjing, which was the legitimately recognized government at that time, uh, led by Chiang Kai-shek. So I just wanted to get a sense from you on how this relationship played out in this interim time when India is transitioning towards independence and the Chinese civil war resumes between the nationalist forces and the forces of the Chinese Communist Party uh, led by Mao Zedong. Uh, well, Raghavan, uh, I always maintain that uh, our first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru uh, was a man who was very astute when it came to international relations. So very early on, even in the 1930s, he felt that as and when India became independent, he would require support and help from other Asian countries in order to craft a post-colonial order. And certainly China as the largest country uh, in the Indo-Pacific was an obvious candidate. And therefore, right from the late 1920s, Prime Minister Nehru reached out to the Chinese uh, leadership, that is the national government of President Chiang Kai-shek. In 1939, he visited China himself. And in 1942, Chiang Kai-shek 
visited India at the height of the Second World War and met Nehru, Gandhiji and others. So to a certain extent, when India became independent, uh, there was both a political relationship with the new national government of China and a personal relationship between the leaders. But I think things began to sour even before we gained independence in August 1949, because earlier the same year, we had held the Asian Relations Conference and Nehru had invited a Tibetan delegation quite distinct from a Chinese delegation. And there were also concerns on the Chinese side that Tibet was being depicted as an independent country with its own flag. So that created some amount of tension and dissonance between the two sides. Uh, if you read the book written, the memoir written by our first ambassador to uh, the People's Republic of China, Sardar Panikar, who was also our ambassador to nationalist China, he writes that on the Indian side, there was a sense that the Chinese were being patronizing towards us, that they saw themselves as the victors of the Second World War, and they expected all other Asian states to accept their predominance in the region. So I think a set of misunderstandings arose well before 1949. And uh, what added to this was that both the Tibetan government and the national government of President Chiang Kai-shek also began to question the whole uh, Shimla agreement of 1914 and the Matmohol line, which defined the India-China boundary. Uh, and therefore, uh, although there were good relations between the two leaders, the relationship with the national government had already begun to go downhill. And then when the civil war began in earnest, uh, I think uh, the events moved so quickly that India never really got a chance to develop any sort of a relationship with the national government. Uh, and therefore, I think when the new regime was established, uh, Nehru and the government felt they could begin afresh because the basic premise was still valid, which is that if you want an Asian order to be built by and for Indians, uh, for Asians, you needed uh, the Chinese regime uh, uh, as a partner to craft it. Sure. And this is a time when you show that the United States' policy towards Asia is also pretty confused and uh, somewhat conflicted in terms, not so much of what outcomes they want, but, you know, how much weight to lend to intervening in the Chinese civil war, where clearly Chiang Kai-shek's fortunes were going downhill quite rapidly. But nevertheless, uh, it seems that the United States itself was not very clear about how much of its weight it wanted to throw into the balance. Yes. Well, uh, Raghavan, the United States, I think, was very clear that China would anchor the post-Second World War Pacific Order along with the United States because Japan, which was the dominant power, had been defeated by them. And therefore, if you recall that even over the objections of Prime Minister Winston Churchill, the Americans declared China to be part of the Big Four and subsequently invested a lot of time and effort to reconcile the, the warring factions in China, that is the national government of Chiang Kai-shek and the, the communists led by Mao Zedong. Uh, it is only when they failed to do so by the end of 1946 or early 1947 that American policy seemed to uh, have no clear objective or direction. Uh, and they sort of wavered between... Uh, continuing to support Chiang Kai-shek in the hope that the government would survive on the one hand and trying to curtail the growing influence and power of the communists in China on the other. And in a sense, therefore, American policy fell between two stools. Now, both the British government and the newly independent government of India recognized quite early on that the communists were likely to prevail, that they were gaining in strength, and that although nobody could really foretell what would happen, it was quite clear that they would eventually dominate the Chinese mainland. And therefore, a gulf opened up, a gap opened up between American policy towards China on the one hand and British and Indian policy towards China on the other. Right. And uh, it is also interesting that even though Britain and India 
more or less came to a similar kind of assessment about what would be the you know future of china under the communist regime etc it is also interesting that they did so for somewhat different reasons it seems that britain's focus was much more on economic and commercial aspects of the situation whereas india had a much more political reading and a somewhat interestingly political reading uh, as you say repeatedly in the book uh, that jawaharlal nehru and perhaps many other indian leaders as well did not necessarily think of the communist party of china as uh, predominantly a communist entity which will somehow automatically be subservient to the soviet union etc but as part of a broader nationalist resurgence in asia and that they believed that china's national interests would come to the fore and in some ways therefore it was important to recognize china as part of a broader asian pattern rather than consigning it into a box as a communist regime yes absolutely i think uh, we have to hand it to uh, prime minister nehru that he was able to distinguish very early on that communist movements whether they were in china in vietnam in malaya or elsewhere were expressions of uh, a, a desire by those peoples to be free of colonial rule it was in a sense a very nationalist movement in but in china and other places uh, communism became the vehicle for the expression of of nationalistic sentiment uh, this was something of course the americans could not appreciate and that too is understandable because they saw the post second world war situation as an ideological uh, battle between the uh, democracies on one hand and the soviet communists on the other and they therefore presumed that all communists would essentially align with and were fully allied with the soviet communists they were unable to therefore distinguish this nationalistic element which had also entered uh, into the communist movements in asia and this i think led to some amount of misjudgment on their part uh, and that is why i think uh, uh, india also uh, began to diverge uh, on china with the united states because from our perspective uh, so long as the movement was nationalist and did not intend to spread communism through the rest of southeast asia it was all right and, and that is why prime minister nehru would say on more than one occasion that he never felt china to be any kind of a threat to india now i think he was largely talking here from the ideological perspective not necessarily the military perspective but uh, of course subsequently it has been suggested that uh, he had a poor understanding of of china and and that you know there was a military threat that he did not foresee yeah sure and we can come to that question in in, in a little while but uh, you know I, it's also interesting that the um, reaction in the united states uh, to china going communist also led to a lot of recrimination within the american system itself right i mean for instance the china specialists in the state department were discredited as people who had misled the united states uh, you know the whole question of you know how did the united states lose china as it were uh, became one of great recrimination fed into the sort of you know later anti communist hysteria within the united states under joseph mccarthy and other things so that also seems to have complicated internal politics also seems to have complicated the way that the americans approached this question of how to deal with new china undoubtedly uh, because uh, let's not forget that the united states had made strategic investments in china because it was going to be their principal partner in anchoring peace in the in the pacific and therefore uh, when china was lost to them it was not just not just the loss of a bilateral relationship but it was it shook the foundations of american post war uh, political order in the uh, asia pacific or the indo pacific since india by then was not independent uh, and indonesia although independent was uh, fighting the dutch there was no other asian country which could anchor uh, american power in the uh, or the new american led order in the pacific at that particular point of time the united states principal focus was still europe the reconstruction of europe and the building of the anglo american atlantic alliance uh, and therefore uh, the pacific was more of a holding operation against the communists 
for this reason, therefore, when China was lost, it created a lot of debate within the United States as to who had lost China. And it did uh, impact both on their domestic politics as well as on their subsequent foreign policy right through the 1950s and even possibly the 60s. Sure. Uh, this brings us to the question that you said was in some ways the starting point of your own inquiry, uh, which led to the writing of this book, which is India's decision to recognize the People's Republic of China fairly early on. Now, uh, as we know, the you know the question of uh, international recognition remains very important for the People's Republic even today. I mean, very recently, I think Nauru has become the 183rd country which has recognized the People's Republic and uh, transferred its recognition from uh, Taiwan to uh, PRC. So this is a matter that clearly, you know, after all these years of the formation of the PRC remains central to them, but must have weighed even more heavily in their minds at the time when the People's Republic was proclaimed and uh, Mao Zedong said that New China has stood up, etc. So um, India's decision perhaps is somewhat understandable against the backdrop of what you explained to us about, you know, them seeing China as a nationalist country. But you're um, sort of probing into the context in which this decision was taken, I think brings out a surprising dimension of how the British perhaps in some ways hastened us along this particular line, which may, we may have anyway taken, but their role was interesting. Could you explain a little bit about what yeah. that was? So I think the, uh, the strategic direction which uh, government of India took, which was early recognition of the People's Republic of China, fully dovetailed with its own view that uh, China should be a partner to India in shaping an Asian order. And if we wanted China as a partner, it made good sense to uh, deliver early recognition to them. Uh, my, I am, however, intrigued by the fact that we never had any asks from the Chinese uh, or any clear objectives that we were fulfilling uh, in recognizing the People's Republic of China. The act of recognition is very important political act. Uh, it is even more important in 1949 uh, when very few countries uh, have recognized China, when the West in general uh, is in opposition to the Chinese and where India's stature is extremely high in the world as a newly independent democratic state uh, which is respected across the world. So for us to simply recognize China without seeking any guarantees on matters of our national interest uh, seems rather odd to me. And it is this which led me to then look at why this happened. Now, undoubtedly, part of it was our own perhaps sense that uh, any problems that we had with China could be resolved after diplomatic recognition was given. Uh, and that's something which uh, I don't necessarily think was a wise decision, but it could be argued that at that particular point of time, it might have made sense. But the other aspect that comes out is the extent to which the British Empire attempted to influence India's policy. Uh, because what happened essentially was that as the Anglo-American competition intensified and Britain was the weaker power, it grew more and more anxious that the American policy, if it prevailed, would seriously disrupt British commercial interests in China, as well as uh, its colony in Hong Kong and its other Southeast Asian positions. And therefore, it was extremely important for them to bring the other major Asian power by then, which is the Republic of India, onto their side. Their anxiety was that if the United States was able to convince India about its case on China, and the US certainly tried to do so, uh, this would, in a sense, make it even more difficult for Britain to preserve what remained of its trading rights in China, its colonial positions, and so on and so forth. So it was a question of British survival. Uh, what intrigued me and continues to do so is why we bought the British arguments hook, line, and sinker. Uh, the British, for instance, said that commercial interests were paramount for them, but India had no commercial interests at all in China. Our interests were geopolitical, very much like the Americans, and yet we went with the British on this matter. Again, uh, the other intriguing thing was when the Americans actually told us to take certain uh, uh, precautionary measures, such as asking the Chinese whether they would abide by international treaties and agreements and so on, uh, 
we again peremptorily dismissed the American uh, suggestions. Uh, and in fact, even went to the extent of saying, if we raise the border issue, it might actually reopen a question which we think is settled. This again is, is, uh, is interesting to me because we should never have presumed that uh, the new regime would automatically agree to the, uh, the, the, the treaties and understandings of previous governments. So I would certainly say it is in the execution of the process of recognition that we uh, conducted a series of uh, moves which uh, defy explanation. Uh, now, of course, in hindsight, it's always easy to say that we could have done something else. But I still think that uh, we were uh, naive, and I certainly use that word knowingly. I think we were naive uh, uh, about how to deal with uh, international relations and how to deal with China. And in this context, uh, there was also a lack of experience as well as a lack of uh, a structure for foreign policy making, which might have uh, alerted us to uh, some errors. Uh, since that was not there, I think we just went with gut instinct and, and that was not the best way to go. Sure. But um, I mean, if I may sort of push you a little on this particular point, right, because there is evidence that you yourself present in the book, which suggests that the Indians did think about this particular thing. The question of whether, uh, you know, we should seek, uh, you know, a Chinese affirmation that all international treaties particularly will be represented. And you quote uh, the Joint Secretary North, uh, C.S. Cha, as saying that the Chinese have never signed the 1914 agreement. So they are not going to now turn around and say that we will uphold it. So in a real sense, our diplomatic position of saying that the McMahon line holds, which you also say Nehru is quoting, was based on an agreement with Tibet. It was not based on an agreement with China as well, which is the fact. So in a very real sense, it's not clear to me what could have been gained by getting the Chinese to affirm a treaty, which even the nationalists had refused to affirm. And of course, the Tibetans were asking for retrocession of Tawang, etc. to them throughout this period. So it's not very clear what we could have got. No, we may not have got anything. And in all likelihood, the communist government would also not have uh, uh, sort of uh, confirmed the Simla agreement. The national government itself did not confirm the Simla agreement. But at least we would have become more alert to the fact that we had a disputed boundary with China. And in that context, then, the subsequent uh, Chinese uh, entry into Tibet in 1950 would have perhaps led to a greater discussion within India about the potential danger or threat that China might pose if the boundary remains unresolved. Uh, to that extent, I think uh, Deputy Prime Minister Vallabhai Patel's letter of November 1950 uh, is very significant and perhaps it would have got greater attention and greater traction if we had at least heeded American advice and made inquiries with the Chinese side. Uh, one of the things that I do bring out in my book is our tendency to presume certain Chinese actions without checking with them. So we simply presumed in this case that in case we uh, uh, raise this issue, it might reopen a closed question and therefore we decided to keep quiet. Now this, uh, in, in the chapter on the Geneva Convention and the Indochina question also similarly, we presumed that the Chinese would be upset if we give the Americans permission to overfly their military aircraft over India and therefore we denied the Americans that permission. The fact is neither did the Chinese ask us nor did we check with the Chinese whether it was all right. We just presumed. And presumption is not the best way to make foreign policy. I think you need to suss out the, uh, the, the, the other side. And I think we consistently fail to do so. That is the, the main point. I, I do not by any uh, means intend to suggest that had we sounded out the Chinese, they would have agreed to the Shimla uh, agreement or the McMahon line. No, fair enough. I, I, I entirely agree with you. I think uh, the point in case is an instance of wishful thinking, of assuming that our wishes would somehow be what is operating in reality. And that has that persisted over a period of time because this particular line of inquiry or this line of dealing with China, which is to say, let's assume that everything is okay till they open up questions, continued for very long and cost us a lot of time in terms of 
and we didn't even use the time wisely to build up our own defenses, etc., which is a, another debate altogether. Uh, but it's very interesting that you should also, uh, you know, the second chapter substantive case study within the book is on the Indochina question, which you referred to, which again, I think is an issue which, you know, we is hardly sort of remembered in both in terms of diplomatic memory, but also in diplomatic history is not an uh, episode that has been given much coverage. And, uh, you know, you have sort of, uh, you just mentioned about how India's, uh, you know, involvement in that uh, was also somewhat kind of slapdash because everything was more or less uh, turning on Krishna Menon, who had a lot of energy, but perhaps not commensurate amounts of judgment and was prone to saying different things to different parties. And again, hoping that some kind of a consensus would emerge, which would be passed off then as a some kind of a diplomatic victory for India, so to speak. Uh, but I, I was just wondering, I mean, what explains the fact that in early Indian dealing with China, you know, uh, we had such outside role of single, in, 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 you know, individuals. You, you spoke about Sardar K. M. Panikar, who again was very important, even though, I mean, both with Panikar and with Krishna Menon, you know, Jawaharlal Nehru never really trusted the judgment entirely. You know, he has written in other places to other people saying that, you know, these people are very sharp, but they tend to overshoot the mark, etc., but nevertheless, they seem to loom very large. So is it a structural weakness or was it that these were very forceful personalities with uh, uh, an ability to carry the day? I mean, how would you look at the system at that point? In time? Well, for one, I think uh, Prime Minister Nehru was a very dominant political personality. Many of the other uh, major political personalities left the stage fairly soon after independence. And uh, uh, aside from that, Nehru was probably one of the few uh, leaders of uh, post-independence India who had been educated abroad and who had maintained a continuous interest in international affairs right through the freedom struggle. So to, to some extent, the personality of our first prime minister and his erudition in terms of foreign uh, policy and international affairs uh, meant that it gave him a disproportionate influence in the crafting of foreign policy. He was also the first external affairs minister of India. So in a sense, he also had a government government position which allowed him to do so. But beyond that, of course, I think there were certain systemic shortcomings. Uh, the uh, diplomatic service was still fledgling in India. Uh, but more than that, I think there was uh, no mechanism which was, of course, subsequently evolved by governments such as the Cabinet Committee on Political Affairs or the Cabinet Committee on Security, where a wider consultation within the government could take place. And there was also less of a tendency to consult beyond the government with strategic experts or to talk about such issues in the media or to consult public opinion. In fact, you will recall that for many, many decades after independence, we were quite proud in saying that there is consensus on foreign policy in India. We may differ on domestic issues, but there is no difference in foreign policy. There is a complete consensus. I suspect that this was more because there was a lack of debate and because the governments of the day did not encourage debate on foreign policy and were not open in discussing it. That in apparent consensus existed than an actual one. And it cost us dearly in the 1950s, we, not only vis-a-vis -vis China, it also cost us dearly, in my opinion, vis-a-vis -vis our relationship with the United States. After all, the United States was a democratic country. It had consistently supported India in our freedom struggle, even to the extent of pressurizing Winston Churchill to give India independence during the Second World War. After the Second World War, it was the country which was giving the maximum amount of economic assistance to India in the 1950s. There was no reason why a stronger partnership could not emerge. But again, I think uh, it was the view of uh, a few people in the government that this was a Cold War, that the United States was on, was on one side of it, that if we strengthened our partnership, we would be seen as being aligned rather than non-aligned. And we again did not therefore explore the full extent and potential of this partnership. We allowed it to go. So I think the, 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 uh, uh, the, the very limited systems we had in making foreign policy cost us dearly in both our major relationships in the 1950s. Sure. I mean, again, I have a slightly different reading of uh, the role of the United States, particularly in the early 1950s, right? I mean, 
See, I mean, Eisenhower and Dulles were frankly swimming against the tide of history as far as Asia was concerned. And I think as you point out in the book, that tide was very much in favor of decolonization and things. I mean, even in the particular case that we're talking about of Indochina in 1954, I mean, the Eisenhower administration was at one point of time even contemplating the use of nuclear weapons in order to salvage the situation for the French, which is an extraordinary sort of measure. And uh, and I think the fact that the Americans were so wrong about Asia was recognized by themselves in the 60s and, of course, early 70s with the opening to China. So it just seems to me that, you know, to expect that India would have gone along with what the United States was doing in places like Indochina does not seem like, you know, that was where the trajectory of things was moving at that point of time. Yes, in retrospect, we can look and say, oh, was that a missed point for U.S.-India relations? But it seems to me at that time, the United States was, you know, totally operating in a very different uh you know, a set of assumptions about what it wanted in Asia, which would have cut against what India wanted Asia to be. I agree with you, but I think we should not necessarily have taken the sort of role that we then took. Uh, After all, coming to the present day, uh, we don't agree with American policy on Russia. Uh, But that does not mean we do not have a partnership with the United States. So you can have a partnership with uh, another country without being without having a complete identity of interests or views or even values. Right. Uh, On the other hand, if you look at the uh, some of the archival material I unearthed, uh, what happened was that uh, Prime Minister Nehru and his principal uh, uh, foreign policy expert uh, V.K. Krishnamenon took a biased view of the Americans and then tried to play the role of mediator. Uh, You know, that being the case, he created suspicion in the minds of the Americans. It's one thing not at all to involve yourself in the issue and to continue maintaining your own independent stance. It's another to first attempt to play mediator and then to obviously take the side of one. And I think it was quite clear that Krishna Menon at least was inclined to believe everything that China said and disbelieve everything that the United States said. And it is that which created a deepening suspicion in the United States. Uh, I think one of the lessons we have certainly learned from that period is to keep uh, issues uh, separate and not to allow the relationship uh, to be dependent on a single issue. Uh, That's certainly a lesson that subsequent governments have learned. And I think if today we are able to keep our relationship with the United States on relatively even keel, despite a couple of fairly serious problems that have emerged of late, it is because of learnings from the 1950s. Sure. No, I think I think that comes out quite clearly and strongly in the book about how the Americans were. Uh, as you say, in some ways, Krishnamen was even patronizing to them, which is surprising given that they were such a more powerful country and so on, which, which I think demonstrates a lack of both diplomatic finesse and tact, so to speak, apart from all the other things that you pointed out. Um, the next two chapters of the book, in some ways, perhaps the ones which uh, speak the most to the present, uh, even though we should not be reading history only for speaking to the present, but nevertheless, I at least felt that you know those had so much uh, deal with the Taiwan Strait crisis of the 1950s. Uh, And could you just walk us through what both the nature of the problems was uh, and what India's position and attempts. And again, uh, in all of these cases, you know, starting with the issue of recognition, but also of the, you know, the uh, Indochina problem in 1954 and the Taiwan Strait crisis, uh, India and Britain are more or less along the same sort of wavelength, if not on the same plane on all of these issues, whereas the United States is quite different. So I just want you to sort of, uh, you know, take us through a little bit of that history, particularly of the offshore islands and others, which is much less understood today. Uh, and particularly of India's role, which I think is hardly at all known even within our own community of uh, community of experts and others. Right. You know, well, Taiwan became uh, a symbol of American resistance to communism after China became communist in 1949 and then challenged the United States of the Korean Peninsula in 1950. Uh, once that happened, uh, the United States began to look at both the Soviet Union and the Chinese communists as being uh, a united front. And in order to build a defense against this united front, the United States built the island chain stretching from Japan to Indonesia, of which Taiwan was a very critical part. Uh, 
uh, and therefore the sustenance and uh, uh, preservation of the national government on the island of Taiwan became a critical national security objective of the United States. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that the United States and the major powers had themselves admitted uh, in during the Second World War that after the war ended, the island of Taiwan and the other small islands uh, off the shores of the main island would revert to China uh, since it had been colonized by, the, by Japan in 1896. So notwithstanding that, uh, and notwithstanding the fact that international opinion broadly supported China's sovereign claim on Taiwan, the United States continued as a strategic objective to support the Taiwanese. And this then became the source of major tension between China and the United States, because for China, it was an issue of sovereignty, what they define as a core issue or a core uh, concern for them. And now what is particularly interesting is that we seem to think that our whole role on Taiwan ended with our recognizing the People's Republic of China in October 1949 and uh, snapping our diplomatic relations with the so-called Republic of China. Uh, in fact, as the book shows, we were very involved in both Taiwan Straits crises. And the reason was not uh, because we supported one side or another. Uh, because we had clearly already expressed our support for China's claim on Taiwan. The reason was that Nehru believed that so long as this tension continued in the Taiwan Strait, it would have very severe geopolitical implications for the region. And it would also complicate India's efforts to harness China's partnership in building an Asian order for Asians. So it was from a larger geopolitical or geostrategic objective that India intervened in both the crises. Uh, now, of course, the, the, the intervention itself, uh, in my opinion, was somewhat flawed because we were clearly uh, supportive of the Chinese and we were also somewhat concerned at what the Americans were doing because we looked at the Taiwan Straits crisis in the context of the much larger Cold War that had developed the Indo-Pacific. Therefore, we were not really, uh, in a sense, shall I say, honest brokers. Uh, we were, in fact, trying to befriend the Chinese uh, and at the same time see that tension did not happen between the two major uh, countries of the, of, the, of the Western Pacific. And that led us into a sort of blind alley because we continued to believe we were uh, even-handed. But interestingly, as I bring out in the book, not only the United States, but the People's Republic of China also did not see us as even-handed. Uh, the Chinese, on more than one occasion in their internal notings, expressed their, their view that India was playing the Western game, uh, that India was uh, aligned with the British on this matter. Uh, so I think uh, the, the, the doubts were there on, in both parties, and I think that itself made it unlikely that we would succeed. The last point you mentioned, so far as Britain was concerned, yes, we were on the same page, broadly speaking. But again, we were coming at it from very different angles. They were still coming at it from a largely commercial and imperial angle. We were coming at it from a modern geopolitical post-Second World War Asian order angle. Uh, and I think uh, rather than trying to understand the British motivations, we went along with them and it became easier, therefore, for the British to, in a sense, manipulate us. And manipulate us, they did. Uh, because uh, as I explained, particularly in the Taiwan Strait crisis, they withheld information in certain cases from us very deliberately. And in other cases, they undermined us with the Americans. Uh, uh, even though uh, with us, they were encouraging us to play a role, they were actually undermining our position with the Americans. So I think while we were on the same page in a very broad sense, uh, I don't think our positions were identical. And I think our presumption that they were similar led us to make mistakes. Sure. And uh, also it's quite striking that India should attempt to play a role of that kind, uh, you know, in, in particularly in the two Taiwan Straits crisis, at a time when, uh, you know, our own material basis of power, so to speak, in particularly in terms of economic power, etc., were quite weak and developing. We were a uh, 
economy, which was not very tied to the rest of the world, uh, or at least wanted to keep that within limits. We had our own uh, ideas about how to develop ourselves as an industrial uh, economy, more by import substitution and uh, planned sort of economic development and so on. Um, So I'm just wondering, I mean, what do you think were the underlying sort of motivations for India to be want to play this kind of a role? Because at some level, it seems that it is out of kilter with material sort of capacities that we had, apart from the institutional failings that you talked about. Well, I think it was to some extent the interest that uh, Prime Minister Nehru had in playing an international role. It was also to some extent the stature we had gained after independence, both respect for the fact that we had gained independence in a non-violent way and because we were the largest state to gain independence and freedom uh, and in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, China was still in 1947 nationalist China. So to that extent, I think there was a certain degree of respect for India, a certain degree of interest in what India's position would be, a certain effort by all the major powers and even the Soviet Union after 1955 to enlist India towards their cause because India was emerging as a leader of the the global south. Uh, I think where we erred was assuming that uh, merely because we had diplomatic and international stature, we therefore had the capacity to make a difference. Whereas, in fact, as you point out, we had very, very limited capacities at that time. Uh, We couldn't really enforce our view. At best, we could advocate it, but we couldn't really enforce it. And I think uh, because we could not understand clearly the difference between intention and capacity, we, in our intentions, we went much further than we could actually support. Uh, And I think uh, ultimately, as I explained towards the end of the 1950s, all the major players, the United States, China and Britain, realized that despite our intentions, we had very little capacity uh, and therefore very little ability to act. And gradually, they all abandoned us. In a sense, uh, by the end of the 1950s, we were pretty much isolated and uh, really our influence in global affairs had declined because of this mismatch. Yeah. Yes. And in fact, you quote Nehru himself as writing to Krishnamanan saying that, you know, if things are going to go south in Asia, I mean, what can we do? And it's, it's more or less a, some kind of a resigned acceptance of the fact that there are serious limits to Indian influence, uh, even despite all this activism. Yes, I think by then he was sorely disappointed that his uh, overture to, to China had failed. And uh, that affected him very greatly, I think. Uh, And uh, therefore, uh, his sort of sense of disappointment, which he expressed in his letter, uh, uh, that he that India really could not play a role. I think there was a greater realization of the realities by then. Do you think the other problem was also in some ways that India underestimated the sort of ideological sort of dimension of the People's Republic of China? Uh, You know, because throughout the 1950s, Nehru more or less holds on to this view that, you know, China is going to be much more nationalist. Whereas uh, if you look at Chinese foreign policy, particularly towards the Soviet Union, but also countries like, you know, uh, like the Vietnamese Communist Party, Vietnam, the kind of support that they gave, or the North Korean regime, all of it was fundamentally ideologically driven. I mean, if those were not fraternal socialist countries, it is unlikely that even Mao Zedong would have, you know, gone as far as they did. Because China was also a weak and a poor country at that point in time. But they did put in a lot of effort into sustaining these other communist regimes and so on. So was that another misjudgment as well? In a sense that was our foreign policy too realistic in the sense of realism as focusing not on ideology, but on power politics alone? I have a different take on this, Srinath. My sense is that uh, the, the problem was that our approaches to international relations, the approaches of China and India were not aligned. Uh, I think uh, Prime Minister Nehru and the government of India genuinely believed that a post-Asian order would be crafted with a number of Asian partners, that China had to be a partner because of its size, its influence, its history, and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, and that it was in partnership that we would build a new Asia. Uh, On the other hand, I think uh, the Chinese, and here it is irrespective whether it was Chiang Kai-shek or Mao Zedong, both uh, had internalized uh, the fact that they were a great power because the Americans and the Soviets said they were during the Second World War. And that therefore, in the post-Second World War order, they would have a dominant role to play uh, 
and that other countries, India included, must play a secondary or supporting role. And therefore, I think we approached uh, the issues of Asia from different perspectives. The Chinese expected India to play second fiddle. The Indians expected China to be equal partners. And I think this is where the gap between them uh, uh, grew larger and larger. So it wasn't so much an ideological gap, I feel, although ideology did play a role, as a gap in terms of perceptions uh, uh, about themselves and their role in international relations. Now, one of the things I do uh, uh, sort of mention in this book is that uh, we had uh, opportunities to take stock of the situation. Uh, after the uh, Geneva Conference, for instance, uh, when, it, uh, when the United States and the United Kingdom went ahead and did the Manila uh, conference and the establishment of the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, we ought to have questioned whether uh, our position was aligned to that of Great Britain. Because uh, we had always argued that any kind of a military alliance in Southeast Asia would further aggravate the Chinese. And yet we did not review that. Again, in the Taiwan Straits crisis of 1954-55, when China eventually uh, uh, sort of uh, did not go with Indian efforts uh, at mediation and went behind our backs uh, and did a deal with the British, we could have again there looked at what Chinese motivations were and adjusted policy. We did not do so. So I think... And all this then eventually, as I say in the last chapter, boils down to the absence of our building out any kind of a foreign policy structure. Uh, surely, uh, eight, nine years after independence, we ought to have had greater cabinet consultations, more debates in the media and in parliament, uh, a greater uh, effort to consult other countries. Uh, but decision making was still very restricted to the prime minister, his close political associates and a handful of civil servants. Uh, and ultimately, let's admit all of these uh, uh, people had grown up under the British Empire's shadow. Uh, they were most familiar with the British. They were all educated, many of them, certainly the civil servants in Britain. They tended to uh, associate themselves more with British civilization than with the Americans or the Chinese. Uh, and, and therefore, I think we, we uh, uh, relied on gut instinct rather than systems and uh, it, it cost us very dearly. Sure. I mean, though, I think the, there was another good reason why the Indians felt that the British were the best external partners to deal with in this uh, system, right? Because see, um, until 1953-54, we had very little sort of to do with the Soviet Union altogether. Uh, till Stalin passes on, we have very little traction with the Soviet Union, partly also because the Communist Party of India here at home is, uh, you know, on a sort of a uh, course of opposition to the newly established government uh, between 1948 and 1950. So we are very strongly anti-communist at home. So that also restricts your options for what we can do. And uh, it is in that context that actually the decision to stay on in the Commonwealth was taken, which, as you know, was a very unpopular decision at that point of time. But precisely because, you know, having at least one of the greater powers uh, giving us some kind of a thing, I think was also another consideration. But I agree with you in terms of what it cost us. I think you documented and, you know, the case is quite uh, irrefutable as it were. Um, I would like to just use the last segment of the podcast really to, um, you know, come back to the present. And uh, looking back, you have spoken about the kind of infirmities of the processes and so on. Uh, is your sense that all of that has improved in the subsequent decades? And are there other learnings potentially from this, uh, you know, historical sort of experience that you have investigated that should inform us perhaps in the event of another Taiwan Straits crisis? Uh, I think we've made considerable progress in building out a, a, a system of making foreign policy between the 1950s and today. And that's inevitable. We are now a mature republic. I would certainly say that there is much greater consultation in the cabinet, uh, that public opinion uh, now does play an active role in at least speaking about foreign policy, although I do sometimes express concern in the level of our public debate on some issues. Uh, there is a greater involvement of, uh, uh, of members of parliament, other political parties and so on. There is, however, one infirmity which we have so far not been able to overcome. And that is the, uh, the sort of connect between the government uh, 
and domain experts outside the government who have done deep research in the subject. If you look at any other major power, the United States, Britain, China, uh, Russia, and so on, uh, there is there are a number of points at which the government of the day consults with strategic experts outside the government, and these can be uh, 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 academicians, researchers, or practitioners, or former practitioners, and to a certain extent gives them access to confidential and restricted information uh, in order to better understand the issue. Because in, in, in modern times, I think governments rarely have the time to go into deep research. Uh, which strategic experts outside the government are doing all the time. Uh, now, uh, there are different ways in which this is done. In the case of the United States, strategic experts are laterally brought into the government. In the case of China, strategic experts are actually uh, a sort of funded by the government because uh, many of the think tanks are state supported. But that's a model that the country involve, evolves. In India, I think that disconnect is very much there. There's virtually uh, no uh, formal channel by which the government connects with strategic experts on issues. And we need to very quickly rectify that uh, infirmity simply because having been a former practitioner in government, I can say it firsthand that uh, I had very little time to do any serious research on uh, foreign policy issues when I was in government. And I am constantly amazed at how much I am learning outside government. Uh, I am also aware now that many other academicians and experts outside government already knew about this. But there was no connect that I had with them. And therefore, I remained ignorant. And I think as we become a major power, a power which is capable of projecting powers beyond our border, we can't have this uh, this gap anymore. Where Taiwan is concerned, Srinath, uh, this is a constant that has remained from the 1950s to the 2020s. Uh, what has changed is the fact that the United States is no longer completely dominant, that China is now quite dominant, that we have growing interests in the region and the British Empire has faded away. So the, the peripheral circumstances around the Taiwan Straits have changed, but the problem of the Taiwan Straits remains. And it becomes even more important for us now because quite apart from the geopolitics, the geoeconomics is involved. Any sort of confrontation there is going to have a severe impact on our economy as well as our as our uh, diplomacy and our uh, our, our polity. Therefore, uh, we need to uh, once again uh, become interested in the Taiwan Strait because it is our business. It is not our business because we dispute the sovereignty. It is our business because our business passes through the Taiwan Strait. Investment, technology, trade, submarine cables, everything passes through that. Uh, and now if we are to get into that business, surely we need to have an understanding of what we did in the past because there are learnings, both positive and negative. And try to ensure that we don't make those same mistakes when for the first time after the 1950s, the two principal powers are once again in a mode of confrontation, China and the United States. So uh, the last chapter was really uh, to sum up the experiences of the 50s in the hope that we would learn from them, uh, we would navigate uh, much more skillfully, but we would nevertheless make the Taiwan Strait issue our business. Sure. No, and I really hope that uh, policymakers, everyone else who is interested in Indian foreign policy as students, analysts, etc., uh, will pick up this book. Uh, I highly commend it to uh, all our listeners. Crosswinds, Nehru, Joe and the Anglo-American Competition over China, which has uh, just been published by Penguin Random House India. It's uh, Mr. Vijay Gokhale's fourth book. Uh, and I'm very sure, sir, there are many more to come. And uh, But today, thank you so much for joining us on this podcast and sharing your reflections on the book and what it means for this present moment. Thank you, Srinath. Thank you very much. We will be back in two weeks with a new episode. 
To make sure you don't miss it, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts from. To learn more about our research and team, you can visit us at carnegieindia.org. You can also find us on social media on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Thank you for listening. See you next time.